Welcome, everybody, to episode eight of the eBay Power Hour. My name is Josh. This is John. And today, we're kind of just going to have a conversation about the site, the eBay site, what's working, what isn't, and blah, blah, blah. Now, I'm going to ask John a few questions. And the first one that I want to ask you is, do you think there is an issue on the site with a lot of overseas sellers flooding the site with similar kind of low dollar value items. I don't know how to explain it, but the items you're going to find on Timu and uh, Alibaba, Alipay, that kind of stuff. Are you seeing a lot of that on the site? It's been that way for years. Been that way absolutely for years uh, where you just look for simple, common, everyday things. Let's say if you're looking for a new cell phone case, you go in and type it up. They're offering a cell phone case for 99 cents who in the U S a U.S. seller, what U S seller can, can offer or compete against that. Yeah. And often free shipping. Well, right. 99 cents free shipping. Now they, they give, you know, it may get here two to three weeks from now, but I think your, your price sensitive buyers are okay with that. You know, it's like, fine, I can make do without a case for two to three weeks if it's going to save me $10. So you think the people that are looking to buy those 99 cent cases, do you think there is a lot more people buying that on eBay or do you think they're moving over to Timu or to some of the other sites to get that kind of stuff? Well, I, I think they're looking Your opinion. For Your, this is opinion, okay. everyone, of course. Just my, my opinion is they're going to go to the site that they're most comfortable with and look for the item that they're looking for. And they're going to search. A lot of these people are going to search by lowest price first and if that happens to be on ebay they're maybe they bought a case before on ebay they'll return to ebay to get that same price now i think maybe where you're going with this is uh this whole bbe thing that i am uh, going there yeah I, yeah that uh you know we you put out something on your live yesterday uh i jumped on it you know, you were saying, hey, check this out. It might be something to make a video on. And I thought, you know what? This is very, very interesting. So I went in. Now, the, the site itself, that's the export.ebay.com. It doesn't explain what. Now, you'd think there'd be some kind of a banner or something at the top or the very bottom, maybe an about page that says this site, export.ebay.com, is an official eBay site dedicated for international sellers who wish to use the ebay.com us platform but it doesn't say that it doesn't make any it doesn't distinguish that within the policies uh it sort of hints to that here and there within the site itself but nothing that's clear so me uh because of that i made a couple of phone calls spoke to us reps my bad on that i mean it's not that i spoke to a us rep i guess it didn't matter who i spoke to uh because they didn't know they tried to find the answer they gave me their best answer which was incorrect and then me passing it on that's my bad on that so so a question for you then yeah. um in light of this because we have talked about bb a lot and you know we're probably right. both talked to death of it but do you think that part of this new policy is to weed out or kind of get that clutter off the site of these sellers that maybe are overseas and providing not a great experience like you said Sometimes these cases come not at all, or they take three weeks. Uh, there's a lot of drop shipping happening. Like there's a whole lot of monkey business going on there. Do you think that might help clean the site up if they're saying, here's the policy and we're going to enforce it? This issue has been a very, very big issue for many years. And many sellers have complained, especially those who've had to compete with these overseas sellers for, for all these years. And I think this, you know, without eBay coming out and saying it, just the writing on the wall. This to me is a way to sort of level the playing field in that, yes, you're still going to compete uh, with those sellers in that category, but uh, they are going to have things uh, measured against them, such as INR, item not received. Whereas you get a case, an INR case that's filed against you uh, for various reasons, and it's not as likely a US seller is going to get an INR case filed against them it's more than likely an overseas seller who eBay has said this case is going to arrive in two to three weeks. 
and it's still in transit after that third week, buyer opens a, an item not received, and then they go through that whole process, it may arrive a few days later. I would see that maybe eBay recognizes that as a way to weed these kind of sellers out so that these buyers are no longer disappointed uh, after waiting two to three weeks and still not having whatever item, let's say in this case, their cell phone case. So for me, I think it's a win for U.S. sellers, but it also tells me that if eBay is looking at things as item not received as a negative metric against the seller, any seller, in this case, international, what's next? Is it coming for us? That's kind of what I'm thinking. And the, the, the thing about that is I could see them to use that as a, a way to get rid of bad international sellers. But if they're using it as a way to weed out the U.S. sellers, that's a mistake because once we get that, that uh, pickup scan from the carrier, it's out of our hands. You know, we're dealing with, you know, one of the major carriers. And if they have an issue with getting that item to the buyer, it shouldn't be our fault, especially if we're on top of things. We, we speak to the, the claim that the buyer opens in a timely manner. We even maybe give a resolution um, like a refund, you know, and then wait for the item to be delivered, then deal with eBay to get our money back, that type of thing. If we're proactive as sellers, there should never be a case where that metric is counted against the seller, in my opinion. Yeah. And I think for eBay now, I think eBay's own words is that they want to create a trusted and world-class marketplace. And I think one of the reasons why they want to do that is because uh, they are, there are certain categories they're really after, but they're not going to achieve that if people are having a bad experience with a $2 dish towel that takes three weeks to arrive. Now, one thing um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but there used to be, there used to be a subsidy for Chinese companies and Chinese manufacturers for shipping that everything under a kilo or every kilo of weight that you shipped, you would get subsidized up to 30 cents for, so for our American friends, that's 2.2 pounds. So, effectively sellers overseas sellers could ship for only 30 cents everything would get subsidized back by the chinese government or overseas government or well let's call it what it is the chinese government right. so when people are wondering how they can ship for 99 cents uh free shipping that's how they're doing it now i don't know if that still exists but it did at one point i think the way they're kind of getting around this a lot of them is um setting up um, shop in the U.S., but it's still a Chinese co corporation operating out of the U.S. Uh, and shipping from a U.S. warehouse. And in that case, I mean, I don't know what my opinion is on that. Um, I think the unfair part of that would be that if there is a shipping subsidy, I don't feel like that's fair to U.S. sellers who don't get that shipping sub sub uh, subsidy. No, well, it's not fair at all. It's not fair at all. And I'm looking at a site, uh, just random site I pulled up here called Freitos. And it's talking about uh, how it, it's about $3 for air. Uh, the air freight cost for from China to the U.S. is about $3 per kilo. And uh, Express is $5. I'm looking at the regular post. It doesn't really say. You can imagine it's a lot cheaper than that per kilo. On yeah. That. Um, but yeah, even, know. you can't compete. If, if, if the, the seller is paying like 15 to 20 cents, to ship this item from, from China to the United States, they can offer an item at 99 cents, knowing their 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 manufacturer cost is maybe 20 cents, maybe yeah. 30 cents, and they can make 25, 30 cents off of the sale after eBay takes their cut. Yeah. So how can you compete with that? You know, they sell thousands upon thousands of this whatever widget, and here you are just trying to sell a case of them and you can't sell, but maybe once a week and you're only selling it. To, you're only selling it to the buyer. Who's not really price sensitive. They're more time sensitive and they can't wait the two to three weeks. Yeah. So, and I think that, you know, I would agree with you that that perhaps eBay is looking at that as a problem because I mean, they have all the data. 
So if right. they're seeing that buyers are having a bad experience and they're they're seeing that there's those bad experiences are happening from a certain area, then perhaps they're cracking down. But I also want to that might not be the case. Again, everyone, this is our opinion. We're just saying right. our opinion. Now let's just preface everything that we say. I mean, it should be a given by now that yeah, we're chatting. Well, we try to give information that we find uh, involved in the conversation, but a lot of this is just Josh's, you know, his input, my two cents. Yeah. And we just put it out there and mainly to start the conversation. Chances are you guys might know more about certain subjects than we do. And we hope that you contribute to the conversation and put that information down below. So the mm -hmm. other reason why I think maybe they could be enacting this policy and tell me what you think about this is that since they've taken over their own international shipping now and they're developing that program, that maybe uh, there are some legal things that are lagging that they have to enact formally. And maybe then that's not this big of a deal, any of it. Maybe it's just something that we don't even have to really give a second thought to. What are your thoughts on that? I, I, I think it boils down to one thing. It's, it's a buyer problem. It's a problem. And maybe they have to... Uh, maybe explain this to their shareholders. Uh, why are you losing buyers on the platform? And I think that this has been a problem for a very, very long time, many, many years, but it's from what I recall, just the last few years where eBay has been really losing large amounts of buyers. And knowing that this has been a problem for a long time, I think you uh, rebuild that, that buyer base with uh, by getting rid of bad sellers like these, you know, it's, you know, these buyers, they don't read listings. You know, we can't even get them to read our listings when we, we have defects or problems with the item. And they definitely don't read um, different things such as, you know, shipping or how long the item should, you know, if you have, let's say you're a regular US seller, you have three days handling, right? And someone buys an item from you the item isn't shipped by tomorrow, you know, two days later before you're even supposed to ship it, they're asking you where, you know, have you shipped this yet? Yeah. Because they don't even realize that you have three days handling. They don't look at that range of dates that eBay has provided. So now they're buying this really cheap item from one of these overseas sellers with a three week delivery period. And they don't even realize it's supposed to take that long. I can see people like that opening up an INR and it's going, it, according to the policy, it says it's all INR cases, not just these or those. Every single one is counted against the seller. So I can see eBay using that as a way to really clean up the site of these sellers. And really, the only the ones that are really on top of their game have a way to maybe to stay on top of it all are going to be the ones left standing to compete against, I think. That's just... I yeah. think it's a buyer problem. I think it's exactly uh, one way they can they can bring back buyers, and I think it's going to extend eventually over to U.S. sellers. I just I just believe that because it's a big problem. I think it's a problem, and if eBay's numbers are being affected by a loss of buyers, you better believe that eBay believes it's a problem. Well, and eBay's got a monumental task on their hands because they have. Um, millions of users at any given time and they have to police it but not over police it and mm -hmm. all those users are well not all but a good majority or a good many I should say of those users are always looking for a way to kind of skirt the rules and get some sort of advantage but eBay has to police that I think yeah. that is a huge huge task because conceptually I love the idea of eBay. I, I love the site. I, obviously, we all do, right? We're all on eBay. We all love it. But what a job. What a job to monitor all that and police all that. Think of all the crazy things that sellers are doing to skirt the rules and buyers and buyers. But to me, the rules, I mean, it seems like a lot of people complain how restrictive eBay is, how uh, anti-seller eBay is. And it feels like that, right? But if you rewind things a little bit, you go back to the days, uh, what we called eBay, the wild, wild west, where we didn't have an automatic automated payment system like we do with uh, uh, the hell do they call it now. But even before PayPal, it was checks and money orders. Yeah. I remember 
Okay. Cash in the mail. Cash in the mail, even though we discourage people from doing that because there was dishonest sellers who would say, you didn't send me any cash. Okay. You prove it. I didn't get anything in the mail. So that's why people sent money orders and checks. I remember getting burned on a $500 money order that was counterfeit, believing that because it was a money order that it was all good, right? Wasn't waiting for a check to clear. It was a $500 uh, uh, diamond, just a cheap eye clarity, like one and a half carat diamond. We shipped it out to them. The thing came back as bogus. They hit my account with a fee. Uh, and this person never responded again, never to be heard of again, the other side of the country. So what am I going to do? Fly out to whatever state they're in and try to find this person and, you know, serve them small claims. You know, people know what they're doing. That was the wild, wild west back then, right? You had trading. No I, we used to trade. I remember trading on eBay. If I wanted something and they'd yeah. say, I'm, I'm not selling it. I'm willing to trade it for this. And they would send you that thing and then you would send them the other thing back. Right. And just imagine how many times people got burned oh. uh, in the wild, wild west with no seller, yeah. no buyer protection. And that's why eBay has over the years developed these things, but they continually have to keep going and developing new things because it's, there's still issues on the site. Yeah. And they have to keep that buyer trust. If buyers don't trust the platform they're buying on, they're not going to come back. And I but, think that that not only concerns eBay, but it should concern every seller, every serious seller on the platform. Yeah. And I think the the counter to that is, well, not really the counter, but you'll have sellers saying they're restricting me and what I can do a little bit at a time. So it's kind of always like the delicate balance of how do we create a safe site that operates efficiently, that meets buyers with sellers, but also... Um, you know, you don't want to upset the apple cart too much, which I think has happened. And a lot of people feel upset with the platform. Well, let's talk about that, though. Uh, what is eBay really restricting? What are what is eBay currently doing right now that's restricting the average seller on the platform? Now, I'm wondering if, if the people that are complaining in this way are the ones that are saying, look, I want to be able to sell my items with no returns and I don't want to have to be forced to accept a return. Now, in, in my opinion, I think that eBay should allow that, but you're going to be buried well, well, well at the bottom of, of search results because yeah. eBay, you got to understand, and you should want this as a seller. You should want the platform to want a good, positive buying experience for every buyer that comes to buy items on the platform because I would rather that buyer come back a second time and possibly buy my item rather than say, well, forget eBay. I had a bad experience. This guy didn't even want to let me return my item. I'm going to go somewhere else and try that platform to see if I have a better experience because that's what's going to happen. And they're going to tell about 10 people about the bad experience they had. And they're yeah. going to think it's about buying from me next time. And I had nothing to do with that. Yeah. And the, the alternatives are nipping at the heels of eBay, the alternative platforms. They want eBay's market share and they're working hard to get it. That's right. It's a battle between Mercari, Poshmark, uh, heck even Amazon. But I mean, Amazon's in their, their own little uh, class. I don't think uh, they're as worried about eBay, but eBay uh, is concerned when all these little sites pop up because every time that happens, that takes away some of their market share. And that may be also where some of these buyers are going quarter over quarter. But I guess my question still stands and maybe I'll put you back on the hot seat. What are some things that are really restrictive to current sellers on the platform the, the people that are complaining, what are some issues? And, and if you're watching, put it down below. If you are concerned that eBay is so restrictive, they're not allowing you to do some things that you would like to do with your business. What is that, that they're not allowing you to do? And why do you feel that you should be allowed to do that? Love to know. So, so for me to answer that, I would say just reading the boards, the community boards over the past couple of years, 
Mm -hmm. uh, some of them would be, um, for example, holding payments on returns. I think yeah. that's a good policy. Not everybody feels that way. Um, restricting what's allowed on the site. So there is a YouTuber who sold a lot of adult material on the site. It's no longer allowed. And that person is stuck with all that material and all that investment. Again, right. I mean, it's neither here nor there, but there are multiple categories that were kind of like that. So they may feel that that's restrictive. Um, now, okay. a lot of, let me give you one more and then I'll give it back to you. Uh, okay. pr promoted listings is another one uh, where people are feeling now that the site is pay to play and they can't just put their stuff up and get visibility. I'll throw it back. Okay. So it, it, it all boils down, at least the first two examples that you gave, like the holding of payments, for instance, it all boils down to the, the buyer experience. Okay. I'm willing to, to bet you if 99% of sellers did everything they're supposed to do, then we wouldn't have a lot of these restrictions that people are complaining about. Um, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunately it's the bad sellers that cause eBay to create these problems, right? They kind of nip it in the bud and say, okay, you guys can't do this anymore. Or when you start up a new account, we're going to hold your payments until that item shows as delivered. Why do they do that? Because historically there have been some sellers who will sell a ton of items, which is why they cap you on how many items you can list in the first place, sell a ton of items and maybe uh, collect the money and jump ship and never deliver yeah. on, on the goods. And yeah. yeah. And then, so what was eBay going to hit the credit card on file or the bank account on, on file? Fine. They've already cleared the money out of there. Yeah. So I, I'm sure these things have happened over and over again, became a problem just because you and I haven't heard about these specific cases. Doesn't mean it never happened. Yeah. Uh, and eBay is constantly creating processes to not only protect their bottom line, I'm sure they had to make these buyers whole, but they they want to protect the buying experience. Number one, that's their brand. Why yeah. would they want a buyer to leave the platform thinking how bad of an experience they had on eBay? That's not good. And they have to protect that brand. So every time they make these restrictions that uh, make you feel as a seller that you're confined to operate within what eBay is telling you to do, whereas if you had your brick and mortar, you can do whatever you want, not accept returns, right? Well, it's done for a reason, and I think we should all appreciate that it's being done so that these buyers will come back and buy from us again. Yeah, and I think, too, that um, now that eBay is moving more towards ads, I think there are a lot of items that used to be on the site that are not necessarily advertiser friendly. So as they get into the Google ads and the meta ads and everything else with their offsite advertising, Meta, Google, and them might say, look, we have no problem, but there are certain things we don't want advertised th through our conduit, like yeah. hate stuff that used to be allowed or adult stuff or whatever the case may be. Uh, so maybe eBay was like, you know what, we'll cut those categories. Maybe they had some cleaning up to do so that they could get in with those advertisers. I don't know. Well, a lot of it is is the payment processors. So there's um, that, yeah. I, that, that Apple, uh, Apple Pay uh, yeah. was not on board with some of the categories that eBay was offering. And I believe it was the mature audiences uh, uh, also uh, for a little bit of time. I think they came to an agreement about coins. Uh, they had a problem with, with that. So eBay, when developing their own managed payments program, had to make concessions so that they would be able to take uh, multiple forms of payment. And, and Apple Pay, that's a big one, right? That's Apple huge, yeah. Uh, and they, when they were putting together managed payments, Apple Pay was like one of the biggest, more, most emergent payment methods that uh, everyone wanted. And I don't know how hot it is now. I think I still have it, but um, I think for many people use it. And eBay wanted on that platform and stay relevant. I mean, you can't just expect to take credit cards and PayPal. You got to be able to open it up yeah. to take as many relevant payment methods as possible. And people were upset because it caused them to lose categories that they were selling in. Yeah. And the whole the whole Black Americana thing, I think you have a segment of the buying population that were just complaining. And uh, I have my opinion on that. I think, you know, as far as history is concerned, when you're selling history, okay, you're not uh, you're, you're not creating a new item, right? That's a that's offensive to a particular 
uh, you know, group of people, you are basically saying this actually happened or, or this is the way life was 60 to 100 years ago. And I'm simply selling that piece. OK, this is an, an item that people are looking for because they uh, remember that. Right. Or it's within their family heritage or whatever. But yet eBay decided based on a number of complaints to hold, totally wipe that out. So whether or not you agree with it, um, this is this is kind of what happened. And I, I think that also is uh, sort of directed at uh, the buyer experience. They had just too many complaints from uh, certain people and they wiped out those categories. And as a business, we should all be thinking, tell us what the rules are and yeah. we will play within our lane. I think that's there's you know, I say this all the time, but there's no easy button. Sometimes people try and find a way that's easier or quicker or, but I don't know. What do you think? I, there's no easy button for me. It's a grind. It's a daily grind. It's not, it's not simple. Well, that's, that's our fault. Um, as far as YouTubers, that's our fault. If there was not a YouTube channel under the reselling genre, people would find themselves what I, what I call eBay Island and trying to figure it out for themselves. Many would quit. Uh, others would succeed through trial and error after making many, many mistakes, but they, you know, we show these videos and we, a lot of times we don't show, uh, the times we fail, uh, or, um, we only show, we, you know, we, we edit the hell out of these videos and only show the, the positive things. Look, I found this item for five bucks. I sold it for 200, right? Who wouldn't want to do that? And so you get people that think, well, that's easy. I can quit my nine to five. I'm making 15 to $20 an hour. I can take five bucks and turn it into 200 and I'm good for a couple of days worth of work. And then they find it's not as easy or lucrative as what we make it seem like. And here we are. So it's like a pendulum and it swings one way and that's all sunshine and roses, which is what I think we had. And then it right. swings the other way where it's all doom and gloom. And I'm seeing a lot of negativity in the community now uh, and not a lot of optimism. So right. do you think that the content that's out there now, because a lot of eBayers who are also content creators are really struggling right now. Uh, do you think that that might dissuade or dismay people from getting into this and doing this full time? Uh not really. I, I think because there's still not enough of these content creators showing the reality of what's going on. So they may say, OK, I only made one hundred dollars a day or I haven't had any sales today. But if they're not sharing like, hey, I am like literally um, one bad week away from like being evicted, you know, um, I mean, if there are any YouTubers out there that have that. Which many, many resellers are in that situation. Many are. Yeah, but how many YouTubers, maybe with smaller channels, I'm sure with the larger channels are getting hooked up with revenue, AdSense revenue, uh, to where maybe they're now more a YouTuber than reseller, right? But I'm talking about the smaller channels that we tend to find. I, I've followed many small channels throughout the years. And uh, how many of these smaller channels who aren't getting hooked up with YouTube revenue um, and are selling stuff that they were successful with years ago but not so hot now that are literally one bad month away from disaster. Man. And they're not, and they're not sharing that with their audience. Of course I get it. I mean, it's their business. It's not the audience's business. It's not my place to tell any YouTuber what they should be sharing with their audience, but people who are very, that's why they call us in, in, influent. And I can speak English today. Influencer. They call us influencers. <laughs> They call us that for a reason, because we influence a lot of new people who make these decisions. I kind of I, I don't want anyone to ever quit their job because they see what I'm doing. Uh, I hope that they take the time to really um, do the business for a solid six months to a year. And if, it, if they're killing it, then maybe decide to, to quit their job. But um, it, unfortunately, us influencers are the ones that are um, showing people more good than bad. And because of that, 
um, it's misleading a lot of people, I think. Yeah, because I mean, I'll tell you that it it's not as easy as what some make it out to be, but it's also not as hard as what right. some make it out to be. Right. But you do hard. go through these periods that are just I don't know if you feel this way, but it feels like all the odds are stacked against you and it happens over and over and over. I have a feeling that that occurs with every single business. It doesn't matter the business you start. True. I agree with that. I agree with that. So, um, and for me, that was the summer. I had, a, I had a real hard time in the summer and hopefully now we're kind of getting out of that. But as entrepreneurs, we all have to, once we get through the gates of, of that, <laughs> you know, really reflect back and then look at, what happened and what could I have done better? And sometimes it's a hard thing to do. Do you find yourself, do you reflect back on decisions you made and you kind of think to yourself, where could I have done this differently? Or that was a great idea. I need to do more of that. All the time, all the yeah. time. You, you take note. This is how you learn. This is how you grow is by learning from your experiences. So the idea that you, you're going to get out here and succeed every time because you saw it on YouTube, that's not realistic. In fact, you shouldn't even want that to happen. You should want to fail along the way. There's nothing more rewarding than that feeling of how I screwed up. I bought this whatever lot and I failed, right? It sucks at the time, but guess what? That pain, um, you're, you're not going to repeat the same mistake again. You're going to be more careful next time. And you're going to remember that pain, that that uh, you know, the time that you had to spend to list these items, right? Just so that you break even, yeah. and that's a learning experience that I think every reseller needs to go through um, in order to succeed. You have to fail to succeed in life, and eBay is no different. I've I've uh, had a lot of people reach out to me and say that they doubled back over their inventory. And uh, honestly, with my videos, that was not my intention to have people do the things that I was doing, but they did it. And, you know, they said they got better results, but I, I more want to focus on if you were to spend all that time listing a thousand items to delist them all, take them all down, rework them all, lot them up, just complete like all these things. That's hard to do because you've already invested a lot of time into it. But That's sometimes right. those hard decisions are necessary. And I'm not telling anyone to do that. But sometimes things like that have to happen. But but again, it's it's being influenced to do these things like list, 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 list. I mean, for many years, that was the theme on many channels. How many can you list in a day? How That's many right. can you list yeah. in a day? Instead of maybe focusing on how many that you listed, how much money did you put in your store? How much value did you add to your store? That should have been the mentality, but they shouldn't have, we shouldn't have stopped there as, as YouTubers. We should have said, look, you have to run your, you can't just throw items in your aisle and never go through and adjust. You know, you see in a brick and mortar, um, you have, what is it called? There's a terminology for it where you go in and you straighten everything up. Okay. And if you just left it a mess, with, you know, when the buyer at the end of the day, the buyers are going through your merchandise and you left every aisle a mess, um, you'd have a good problem. housekeeping, good housekeeping, right? It's housekeeping, knowing where your inventory is, um, you know, going through, making sure it's there, making sure eBay hasn't taken the listing down. These are all things that you need to do. But if you're sitting on items that have not sold in months, maybe it's time to go in and, and see if that item's even selling for anyone by just doing a simple uh, search for the solds and then then adjust accordingly. Okay, so you haven't sold this for months. Other people have sold it. What have they done differently than what you have done and adapt to what they're doing so you can get that item the hell out of here. Now, I think that the list, list, list uh, advice was good advice at that time when everything was selling. Because yes. since everything was selling, just crank it out and it's gonna move. But then the macro changed, the macro economy changed. And if you kept that model and when it was happening, it was really hard to see that there was that quick of a change. But if you kept buying that much inventory and listing that much inventory, you weren't selling as much. Now you've got a whole other problem on your hand. Right. Buyers are more selective. 
and uh, they're not buying everything. Uh, they don't have they don't have the, all that 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 money that the government gave them, you know. Yep. And it's not the money is harder to come by. People are feeling a pinch. Um, credit card usage is higher than it's ever been. Watching some of these financial shows, and at some point, I mean, it's, I feel, and I hate I hate to say this, but I feel like it's going to get worse before it gets better. I hope not. I hope not either. I but not. I mean, uh, it, it would do no service to anyone if we sat up here and just tried to say, well, yeah, it's going to be great in 2024 when there's nothing that is indicating that it's going to be better. I think, I believe personally that interest rates will start coming down. But I think these crazy swings that we've seen of lots of free money and all of a sudden high interest rates, high inflation, I think it's going to move a lot slower. So if rates come down a quarter percentage point, that doesn't mean that the buyers come rushing back in. So, right. you know, it might be a slow, maybe we are in the bottom, maybe we're not, but then it slowly comes back. But a lot of people are so hev heavily levered and have so much debt over this business. They can't wait for that slow comeback. I don't think. How many people are going to hang on and actually be okay by the time that yeah. it corrects itself? Exactly. Uh, a year from now, two years uh, from now, um, at what point are you going to have to just call it quits because, you know, you, you're not able to pay your own bills? It's a real exactly. thing. Exactly. And when they cranked up the interest rates in the late 80s, which was much higher than now, um, maybe four times or three times higher than what they are now, it really took till the mid nineties for things to really get going again with the advent of internet and everything else. And then we started booming up again. So, you know, it could be a while certainly. And I, I think those times, the crazy wacky times that we've seen over the past five years are over, <laughs> you know, it's a and whole that, different environment. That's why, you know, for me, it's how do you make eBay work for your, your situation rather than how can I sell the things that I like that I've, yeah. I've, I've been used to selling, you know, how do you make that change? And, and that's the biggest thing. How do you adapt to where you're making reselling work in the current market and current environment? And that's the toughest thing I think people are going to have. I happened to get very lucky. Uh, you know, I wasn't, I was still stuck in, you guys know my story, I was stuck in my own way that's telling myself, you know what? I've just had a bad run of lots, bad run of pallets. The next X amount of pallets, you know, mathematically, I'm going to start getting some good ones. And it just got worse and worse. And until uh, my decision was either hang it up, do something different, uh, or figure out a way to find something better to sell. And it turned out that the higher ASP model that I've touted ever since has been what's worked and not only a small improvement we're talking night and day as compared to what i was doing so uh maybe that's not the change for most people maybe it's something else i'm willing to believe that maybe if you're a, a certain seller in a certain niche and it's just not working anymore there's lots of different items out there that buyers are still on ebay trying to buy you just got to figure out what it is and do that well, and the first step is acceptance, which for some of us takes us a lot longer to get there than others. And you're saying, right. for example, your liquidation pallets, how it was getting more and more expensive. And, you know, you didn't accept right away that things have changed with liquidation, but you eventually got there. That's my story with uh, storage lockers. The price went crazy. And even to this day, now I'm not doing storage lockers, but I'm like, maybe one will come up, but they just get more and more expensive. So now am I at the point that I just have to accept that I can't source from storage lockers anymore? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, it may be. It may be. You know, uh, it works for some people, but it's almost like when I was buying those, the pallets of the 20 that's like 22 by 20 by 13 Amazon mystery boxes. Okay. It's basically general Amazon customer returns that were returned. Uh, and you know, you'd find initially when we first started buying those, you'd find, I found a, a $1,200 brand new Sony camera lens in there. 
uh, you found just all kinds of really good things. And over time, it, you can tell it was uh, you're finding less and less of those uh, home runs. And it was obvious it was cherry picked. And I'm thinking that, uh, you know, with the storage lockers, you hear a lot of things of where these storage units or these companies that own the storage units are staging a locker or a storage unit to look yeah. really you have these great boxes that are empty and you yeah. go in and buy it and you find nothing in there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. It's, it's a lot of greed by the people who shouldn't be greedy. You know, in, in the case of liquidation, you've got a lot of middlemen who uh, aren't happy with the fact that, you know, they're making a pretty good margin on the loads that they're selling to these other companies. It's not enough. So they got to pull out the Xboxes. They got to pull out the PlayStation. <clears throat> They got to pull out yeah. the higher end stuff so they can make even more. And yeah. uh, as long as that's happening, things like this in the industry are happening. It's going to be tougher and tougher for the average reseller to make things like liquidation and storage lockers work. Well, and storage lockers, too, a lot of times you're dealing with employees who are maybe making minimum wage and they're the ones snapping the locks. So if they can pull a thousand dollar pair of sneakers out of there or whatever the case may be, you know, the temptation, it's hard hard not to because no one would know so right. certainly i agree with you there's a lot of that and a lot of staging from owners and all sorts of stuff now i want to derail you a little bit here wow that's not hard <laughs> so, to do <laughs> so i sent i sent you a text the other day and i've noticed yep. this a, a lot and i should i should probably send you more of this but i'm i'm starting to see a lot of amazon sellers flexing so I see it on Twitter. I'm starting to see it on YouTube. The selling of courses, the look how much money I'm making, the brand new Corvette and everything else. And it reminds me of a story we've already seen play out on a different platform. Do okay. you think it's possible that this kind of mania that we saw on eBay makes its way into Amazon and we, we see similar quality control issues and et cetera, et cetera? Or do you think that's a whole different animal altogether I think it's a whole different animal altogether i don't i i think what happens on amazon is an amazon thing and i don't think that uh you know what we do on ebay is is going to translate over to amazon now there's a lot of people who will have their programs just like there's people on on ebay who have programs where they have the what the 39.95 model of come and join my patreon and we'll you know make you a great seller um Maybe it's work for some people. I've never uh, subscribed to that idea because for me, it's about, and I'm sure you feel this way, it's about helping people. And it's not about, you know, making money off of programs and stuff like that. Can't tell you how many times people have hit me up saying, hey, I'll pay you for your time if you can coach me and get me started with the reselling. And it's like, look, I, I don't I do not do that. I, I, you know, appreciate that you're reaching out to me, but um, I'm not trying to, to do this for a little side hustle to make extra cash off of you guys. I don't mind making money off of AdSense, uh, but to sell programs and to do things like that, I'm just, it's never been something that uh, I thought uh, I, I've ever thought it was a good way to, uh, you know, share my knowledge because guess what? A lot of the knowledge I'm passing on in my videos and in the lives are is knowledge that I learned from someone else for free yeah. so why would i charge you for that knowledge come on yeah I, I, go, ahead. go ahead no no go i gotta ahead. say i i'm not i'm definitely not here to help people i'm i'm more here to help myself and i've yes. i've got yes. a lot i mean just watching other people i've taken so much information from them and applied it to my own business and yes. a lot of this is just like one-off comments they're like no i've tried that before don't do that i would right. never have known that had they not popped into my chat and kind of said these things so, right. but along the way, I've made some really kind of good friends like us, like we can yeah. talk, you know, we'll talk on the phone, we can call each other any time of day, you know, you know, and just talk about things and just carry on a conversation that would never have happened otherwise. Right. And, and, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that the, uh, the, the aspect of yes, selfishly, I am learning. I can't tell you how much I've learned from people who have corrected me. Uh, and or shown me a better way. I, I can give you an example. Tommy is one of them. He's messaged me privately on a number of occasions and said, hey, 
have you considered doing this? Or this is one way you can deal with that, right? That would have never happened if I didn't have this channel. Uh, someone like uh, uh, the famous Mike Camparelli out there in Yonkers, New York, a uh, very, very good friend of the channel. Yonkers. Uh, meeting uh, people, true, uh, just really good people. And that would have never happened if I didn't have my channel. So I'm very grateful for that. Now, you had mentioned on your live today that everyone has a, a motivation, right, for doing these things. And um, I think a lot of it is money for people. Um, mm -hmm. For me, uh, that was really not the case. When, you, when you're putting together a channel initially and you, you're not getting any revenue for your efforts for like the first six, seven, eight months um, and you're doing it consistently, there's got to be a lot of, uh, of interest there, uh, a lot of motivation, a lot of other things driving you than just money. Now, money does become part of the equation where it's actually kind of a business. But for me, it's always going to be eBay first. And if that means my content suffers in that I don't get out as many videos as other people, then that's what it is because um, I make the, ma the majority of my money, unlike a lot of other channels, you know, they make the majority of their money off of YouTube. I make the majority of my money off of eBay and I'm proud to say that I do. Well, and also knowledge because, you know, here's the numbers you need to watch. It's the numbers I was watching and people are saying, here are the numbers you need to watch. Uh, here are the categories you need to look at. Here are the things you need to look out for. Here's how ads work. And they're saying all these things and you get all this knowledge. But if yes. you apply that knowledge to your business, how much, how much is that worth? You know, if you get an extra 20% and make an extra 30 or $40,000 because you learned all this stuff. Right. That's a huge amount of value. And if you can apply that at scale, you know, so that's that's kind of how I think of it for me is I kind of just want to pluck this information and steal it from people or they can just give it to me or whatever. Uh, and that I hope I can apply to my business selfishly um, because I make a lot of mistakes, John. <laughs> you know, no, when no. I talk, you go back to my April and May videos and you're like, this guy's bound for failure, honestly. We all do. And just for me, and going back, the idea of just fleecing new people because they're vulnerable, they're desperate, they want to make this thing work, they see that you are making it work, and to, you know, just charge them for your time or information um, that you were given when you started, it was given to you for free. Well, I don't know. That I being just said, because there are so many changes on the site right now, and there are a lot, people are looking for answers. Like, why isn't this working? I tried that and that's not working. Why is this happening? And I understand that people need answers because, you know, their business depends on it. So I understand, right. you know, but I understand why people are, are reaching out looking for answers. I do. You know, reaching out and they're, they're trying to uh, emulate what they see on TV. They want you to tell them, what you're doing, how you became successful, and then they go to apply whatever advice you give them to their own situation. But because their situation's different, they don't make it work the same way. You have access to maybe this type of item through networking and through many hours of research finding that that item, and then they go and try to you know take the information you've given them to their own sourcing, the limited sourcing that they have. And then they wonder why they're they're struggling, right? So no easy button. Every right, everyone's situation is different. There is no one size fits all when it comes to the information that's given on eBay, um, for many reasons. Um, what I do for my business would not work for what you do with your business. No. Uh, for me to say, you know what, this is working for me. Maybe you should do this. Well, certainly don't be against trying it, but have have a um, a realistic expectation that you may not see any results from whatever I just told you to do. That's working for me. Right. And also um, a lot of the people, so let's not talk about us. Let's talk about other people who are talking about the things they're doing and making it look easy. Uh, they maybe have been doing this for 10 or 15 years, maybe 20 years. Uh, yes. So they, 
I mean, they might have a huge knowledge base, where, whereas if you're only doing this part time for a little while, you know, it takes time to develop all that. Oh, exactly. I mean, you just look at, you know, we use tech as an example, tech and sports. Just look at his videos that he's put out the last month and look at some of the bolo videos that guys put out. Just the knowledge base this guy has from just walking around Disneyland is just it just stupid to me. OK. Yeah. And 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 uh, that comes from years and years of experience through studying and hands on experience that a regular seller who's just started is never going to get uh, even through watching videos. You're never going to get that same level of experience. than if you go in, find out what you can buy and what makes you money on your own and develop that level of, of knowledge that's going to take years and years to do. Yeah. And I think being a true expert in your category, and I'm not that way, but if you are in niches, certain niches and certain categories, and you want to develop the knowledge that some of these people have, you would have to be able to walk into a retail location or a flea market or something and pick off of other experts and expert them and catch them lacking. And then you, you truly have a better knowledge. And, and by that, I mean, you know, let's say handbags, for example, there may be a certain variety or a certain model or whatever that you know is rare, but they mm. don't. And when you catch it, like that's the kind of level I think you need to be at or to get to that level, in my opinion. Right. That's going to take a lot of experience. And uh, that's the type of experience most people won't get from watching these videos alone. No, 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 no. I, you know, I've learned most of the things that I've done through making mistakes, honestly, but also I have taken a lot from a lot of people for sure. 100%. But mistakes are so key. They're so important. They're, they're important, but also the same with networking, you know, getting out to the flea market. Okay. You buy some items from a seller um, or maybe you, you see a seller that sells items within a niche, regardless if you're able to buy from them for your own sourcing, pick their brain, meet people, yeah. introduce yourself to them, talk shop with them, learn from them. Um, sunny, sunny Las Vegas out here. Uh, went out to, uh, he has a booth out at the swap meet and just walking around the swap meet and talking about the things that interest him. I was able to learn just so much by picking oh, yeah. his, and it's all because of networking. So it's about getting off of eBay Island, meeting people, even meeting people. Okay. So you're doing this, you're out alone on eBay Island in your town or city or wherever you're at, go to a yard sale. Strike up a conversation with people. You'll find there's other resellers. Talk shop with them. Exchange information. Develop friendships. And learn from each other. That's one way you can do it if you're new to this business. I, I joined um, a dealer group. And uh, because I, I want to get certified um, as a, like a certified dealer in my niches. And I sit with this group. And I tell you, it was the hardest thing for me to do. Because I'm not... I'm not a very social person, despite what you see here on camera. When I'm mm -hmm. out, I'm very withdrawn and I'm not, I don't really strike up conversation. And all these people are very knowledgeable in their field <laughs> and they're all in their seventies and eighties. And then there's me here in my forties sitting with them. And I got to tell you, we meet once a month, but I have a great, great time. And I learn so much from them. So I agree. Sometimes you just got to get out there, rub elbows and just get out, get out there. It's easy to get and, shut down on eBay Island, as you call it. Not trying to throw a stereotype out there, but it's my finding that uh, the older the person is that you go in and ask information, you know, to try to spark a conversation or just to, uh, you know, uh, pick their brain about a certain topic, the more willing I think that a lot of these older folks are in uh, to to share that knowledge with you and to tell you stories and to, yep. to really give you information. So. Take that for what it's worth, even though, uh, you know, I'm probably now considered one of those old guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not me. I'm only 32. I got a ways to go still. Yeah, that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I guess uh, we're getting to the end here. Um, we kind of brushed upon a whole bunch of different topics. We kind of went all over the map, but I like that. I like it when it kind of flows like this. What do you think? 
Yeah, I, I do. I, I do uh, like the way it's just a normal conversation. This is kind of the conversations that we have. And I mean, it started with the uh, overseas sellers with the bad buyer experience conversation and somehow it worked uh, its way into talking to old people. Uh, because yeah. of it. So, hey, so I got something for you. Let me yeah. know what you think about this. Actually, you know, John and I talked about this already before, but get a lot of comments about people that want this to be alive. What do you think about that? And also in the comments, what do you think about that? Would you rather have this live so that you can interact with us? We probably won't get all to all the comments. I don't know. What do you think, John? I think maybe a combination, have a podcast, but maybe also have a maybe every so often, maybe every other week. Uh, in place of the bonus cuts segment that we put out on Wednesdays, maybe just replace that with the live, you know, something like that. Something that Josh and I have been talking about, but really it's, it's uh, whatever we can do to keep the conversation going, to bring more people into the conversation. And if that means that we do it live, then that means we do it live. I'm open to it. I'm open to it too. Yeah. 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 We'll figure so you know, here we are. Uh, by the time you guys are watching this, we're recording this. We're still in November, but by the time you see it, it's going to be the second of December, and we only have one more month left in the quarter, and then we're on to a new year. We're we're, we're doing it all over again, right? So uh, for me, it's just how do we finish this thing strong? Uh, any tips that you can give before we go, Josh, to uh, finish off two thousand twenty three with a bang. This is where you're good. You can fill gaps. You're just you're <laughs> really good at it. You are. I know, yeah. like, I just know you saw the time and you fill the gap perfectly. I, I wish I had that talent. So I'm going to commend you on that. That's a great question. I would say for people that have a death pile, if you have anything new in there, get it listed. Like really in two weeks from now, you're going to have all the panic buyers that want to get this. They need it right away. Please double down on your time. I don't like to give advice, but here I am doing it. Double down on your time and get as much of this stuff up as possible. Don't start with the stuff you just want to get out of the way. Put up the new stuff that can go under the Christmas tree and start really working on getting that stuff up. You don't have a lot of time. You will yeah. thank yourself later. What do you I mean, think? For What's For me, along those lines, it's about just maximize your time, especially for the next few weeks my cutoff in my mind is like the 17th of december where uh i want to go just crazy with getting as much stuff as i can listed and then once i hit that 17th of december i'm kind of realizing at that point well even the last minute shoppers are pretty much done with buying for the holiday season and i allow myself to kind of just um uh, take Without taking a break, I slow things down. And I'm still working every day, but not as hard. I allow myself to go visit family for the holidays, the end of the month. But it's only because I'm busting my ass the first two to three weeks of December to get that extra work done and get as much stuff as I can up so people can buy it. Because there's going to be a lot of people that are watching this right now that are going to have stuff in their garage, stuff in their wherever they keep it, not going to get listed that would have sold had you have taken the extra time to get it listed. So yeah. this is the time guys. There's no, we're running yeah. out of time. We're and it doesn't of- end on the 17th. You might get a little bit of slowdown into Christmas, but then you have people who got money for the holidays that are going to be spending oh. money. You're going to have people who got gift cards. Then we're into tax t- season, people getting money back from taxes. So, you know, Historically, this kind of carries into March strong sales. So get the stuff up. January has always been a historically good month for me. But what I'm saying is take a take a moment. Take that time. You know, find whatever date that is for you. Take time to just unwind, but get back on it uh, at the beginning of the year. And we're back in we're back in work, back to business and getting stuff done. So that's kind of my outlook. And uh, just want to finish off this last month of the year on a strong note. Okay, John, take us away. You've got, you've got the talent. Yeah. I've got the talent to fill gaps, but not to take us away, <laughs> but I, I want to thank you guys for being the best part of this program. Josh and I get up here. We talk back and forth 
Uh, many times, uh, a lot of you don't agree with what we have to say, but that's the beauty of what this podcast is. Uh, it's not an echo chamber. We're not eBay fanboys. I can see a lot of people saying that based on this conversation, that John's an eBay fanboy because, you know, uh, he believes that sellers should be held to account. That's really not the case. It's just simply telling you our two cents. And if it doesn't align with your two cents, that's fine. We can, as adults, have conversations. And um, I, I'm thankful for you guys that are watching. And thank you for, we're already at like almost 900 subs. So you guys, we're almost at 1,000. Put us over. We appreciate you guys. And I, I just want to, on behalf of Josh and myself, thank you for being a part of the eBay Power Hour podcast. And be sure to comment, hit the like button, and subscribe. And until next time, have a great rest of your day. Have a great weekend, everyone. Take care, everyone.